Okay. Welcome, people of the internet. Welcome to Ayn Rand Khan Live. I'm your host, Keith Lockich. I'm a senior fellow and the vice president of content at the Ayn Rand Institute in Southern California. We have a really interesting program for you today. We're going to be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and how to think about this situation and more broadly, how to think about issues like this. We're gonna kind of take a step back from all the details of the current situation and talk about sort of how to think objectively about issues involving infectious disease outbreaks and the governmental response to them and a lot of related issues. So today we were scheduled to hold a live event in Chicago. It was one of our Ayn Rand Khan regional events we've been hosting all around the country. But you know, for obvious reasons, we, we decided to move this event online. We're currently live streaming on Zoom, on YouTube, and on Facebook. So welcome everybody from all corners of the interwebs. Um, now, if there's anybody here who was originally registered to join us in Chicago at our live event, special welcome to you. We're glad you could join us here online instead. Now on the slide, you can see the program for today's event. Uh, we're gonna have three presentations and a general Q&A at the end. Each of the presentations will also have its own question period. So there's gonna be lots of opportunity for interaction. If you're watching this on Zoom, you can use the Q&A module um, to ask questions there. If you're watching on, we're, we're also monitoring the YouTube chat and the Facebook chat, so you can post questions there and uh, we'll, we'll try to prioritize those. We'll try to get uh, questions from everybody. So without further ado, let me uh, turn this event over to my colleague Ankar Gatte, who's, who's a senior fellow and the chief philosophy officer of the Ayn Rand Institute. And he's gonna kick things off with the first presentation. Hi, Ankar. Hi, Keith. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, okay, so you stopped your screen share so I can do mine. As, as Keith said, um, what I'm talking about today is infectious disease under the American form of government. That was the title of the talk. There's three points I want to make today um, and then leave some time for questions. One is about thinking of our current response. I'm characterizing it as a chaotic mess. Um, so that's just a little bit of where I'm coming from and how I think uh, I'm thinking about the current situation. And then as Keith said, we want to step back a little bit. I'm going to ask two, what I think of as fundamental questions that I think we need to think about, um, both during this crisis and its aftermath, including, I mean, there's talk of if th there's further outbreaks, there's going to be lockdowns again. Um, and it, we can't have this kind of chaotic response that we've had. So it requires real thinking. So let me start now with uh, into these, these three points and particularly the first one, obviously, and how, uh, why I'm thinking of it as a chaotic mess. Um, and particularly, I think of it as a non-American reaction. So we, we're faced with a new infectious disease that's certainly contagious and has a considerable degree of lethality. It's, there's many, many unknowns. And I think um, some of the later presentations, particularly probably the second one, will talk in a little more detail of what is unknown about this disease still. But there's many, many unknowns. But it's certainly, when you look at what's happening uh, across America, and particularly in the hot spots, um, you see healthcare workers without protective equipment and they're getting sick and dying. Um, there's no clear uh, idea of where tests are available, how you can get them, the promises made about the testing, none are, have come close to being materialized, um, uh, I mean, have coming true. I mean, it was early, you could, anyone who wants a test can get a test, which was blatantly untrue, but even that it's been surged. And when you talk to patients who think they've had it and so on, the difficulty of getting tested still is enormous. And if you think, what is the strategy for testing? What has been communicated about it? It's very little that is coherent. So if you think just of the, in terms of the hospitals uh, and the equipment shortages and in the testing, it's 
this is it's chaotic it's a mess you see doctors saying like how can this happen in america and i think that's a good question to ask and to ask it at a very deep level that i as i said i think the response is not an american response it's much more that what our government has done is copied governments like italy's and like china's and i would basically put it like there's three stages deny and evade what is happening uh the seriousness of the threat the data that is coming in this happened certainly in china with cover-ups um but you saw the same thing in italy a denial at first that this is serious um and denial even of how it's spread so they continue it i mean italy has a culture that is very hands-on you put it that way and that continued and then it's panic when it's oh no this is serious and so when reality hits you in the face that you've been trying to deny and evade it's panic and the response then government response is lockdown it's we've got to stop everything we've got to shut everything down which is a is a um uh understandable result of panic but it's part of the reason you want to avoid being panicked and so so i think it is uh, an america has fo followed we followed unfortunately a similar kind of of uh, trajectory of denial and evasion of how serious this is it's going to go away it, we've got 12 cases it's going to go to zero and some kind of miracle and then real panic when it was clear that that's a denial of the actual facts and of reality and then pretty quickly lockdowns of whole states and america if you think of it um and what is unique about america it's supposed to be a shining beacon for the world and that's particularly it's a new form of government that the world had never seen before it's a government that is supposed to value freedom self government self responsibility it's not supposed to be a place where the government takes over and orders everyone around orders them to stay in their houses indefinitely while the government does who knows what because it's not very clear the communication even of what it's doing and that's why i characterize it as it's a chaotic it's a chaotic mess and i think it's a chaotic mess because there is no distinctively american principles operative and what we should be thinking about uh, both in the midst of this but it, as i said in its aftermath including there's um plenty of discussion of if there's further outbreaks in the fall uh and further deaths from covid-19 we're going to repeat this pattern and i think it will be disastrous to repeat this pattern and if you think of america in other times of crises say the conflict with the british what is uniquely uh american and what is um admirable about america is it goes back and thinks about like what are the fundamental principles that should be operative here so in the conflict with the british it's like what is proper government we think the british are not acting properly the king is seizing too much power what is proper government and it's a whole you get a whole rethinking of that and a, and the birth of a new form of government with the founding fathers but even if you take say the run up to the civil war it was slavery is is not tenable and thinking about that and then thinking deeply about what are the proper principles that should be guiding here with the abolitionists leading the way in terms of rethinking um the the american form of government which led to a civil war and then to the abolishment of slavery now i don't think this situation is as much a crisis as the war of independence or the civil war and i don't think it's a war we're not in war at war with the virus but it warrants really rethinking about the the role of government in this kind of situation and it's those are the as i said there's two questions that i want to ask in regard to this and then i think in the in the next talk iran will go into some more detail about aspects of these and thinking particularly in light of some of what has actually happened and what the government has been doing but if you ask um so i think one fundamental question to ask is what is government's role in regard to infectious disease 
Um, it has a role, and this is particular. So it's what is a U American form of government? What is its role in infectious disease? So I think to answer that, you have to take seriously the what the basic function uh, of the American government is, what its task, what task it's been charged with, which is put in the Declaration as to secure these rights. Governments are instituted among men. So the rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, what government, why it is, why it exists, why it's there, why it was created um, and ratified, why the constitution was created, ratified, and we have a new form of government is to secure the rights of the individual. And infectious disease uh, for sure falls into this category that if someone is walking around with an infectious disease that he's going to spread to other people, that is an actual active threat to other people. But there's a lot of thinking that has to go into um, how that gets codified into law. So I think one of the ways to think about that what we have is not an American response right now is we do not have the rule of law. And what part of what the American form of government is supposed to be about, what the constitution is, is the fundamental law of the land. And the whole idea of the constitution is we're specifying the powers of government. These are its powers, no others. And this is how we're gonna establish rule of law, not have absolute power in the hands of government officials who have arbitrary discretionary power of what they're going to do. And if you think just recently of the debate where Trump was saying, or oh, said it one, uh, uh, one day, I mean, I don't think he actually has any views really. So it's not like this was his view, but this is what something he said one day, cause it sounded good to him, that, it ha that he has absolute power and he can decide when the country is reopened. And the pushback was basically, no, the governors have that power. But what it means is the governments, ha the governors have that absolute power to shut down uh, a state indefinitely and open it up when they think it's uh, it, it warrants opening up. So it, it wasn't a debate about there shouldn't be absolute power. It was a debate about who holds the absolute power to shut it down and open it up. And I think if if if, if it is true that a, a governor or our state government, if you put it that way, has that much power, something has gone wrong in terms of the American system of government. A part of what the constitution is trying to do and does is significantly limit the power of government and specifies that power under law. So it's clear these are its powers these are when those powers will be wielded, when it will be executed. And we don't have that here. Um, you have much more, to, one of the ways it would be put, you have rule of men, not of law. And it is possible if we thought more about the issue of infectious disease and its relationship to when is an infectious disease a significant enough threat that it warrants coercive countermeasures, that it, it warrants government intervention. And then what kind of government interventions? And if this was specified under the law and really specified, people would know in advance what the powers of the government are, and they would be able to uh, adjust and their actions and their preparation um, for this, uh, the possible eventuality in the case of a pandemic and the severity of a pan pandemic. But if, if you think of, um, so, so let's take as, as um, wh what it would look like to legally specify in advance the range of threats and the appropriate coercive countermeasures that government would have. So that what you have is rule of law and not of bureaucrats or of uh, government officials who seem to have, uh, unspecified powers. Um, and I think there's, as, as I said, there's, you have to think about the range of infectious diseases and try to codify them 
into the law. And part of thinking about the range is how severe an infectious disease is this when you're thinking about it being spread to other people. Um, so something like the common cold is an infectious disease. And it, you do, if you're spreading it to other people, it's, that is a negative for them. That is you're doing damage to them. It's, I mean, if you lose a few days of work because you've caught a cold, that is, I mean, that is a negative for the person who's been infected. If you're a carrier and you've infected someone else. But we don't think of that as um, rising to the level of, okay, that's an interference with someone else's rights. And so the government has to step in and say, you have to stay at home if you have the common cold, or even we're going to try to um, not, uh, we're going to coercively quarantine the whole household that if someone has the common cold, it doesn't rise to that level of severity. And thinking about another infectious disease, the seasonal flu. Um, so it's true that this is not, that COVID-19 and what we're faced with now, SARS-2, is not a seasonal flu, it's not even a flu virus, but it's relevant to think about the flu, I think, precisely from the point of view of it's an infectious disease. It's spread by people. It results in significant damage to people who get infected, including a significant amount of hospitalization. When you look at the seasonal, when you look at the statistics for seasonal flu, the hospital the hospitalization rates are not insignificant, and the deaths even are not insignificant. So it's a serious disease, and yet we don't think of that even as rising to the level of, okay, the government is going to step in and quarantine people who have the flu or demand that they uh, self-isolate and so on. It's, this is part of the um, risk of living. And if you're living in, a, in more uh, densely populated places and you interact with more people in cities like New York City, this is one of the risks of that um, of living in that kind of place versus living in rural Montana or something like that. And this, the, the more this is specified in advance, and if you think that there's at least, I doubt this is exhaustive, but when you're thinking about infectious disease, you, you at least have to think about these kind of different axes. Um, how contagious is it? Uh, and the, I mean, when you read about infectious disease, there's a, quite a continuum of how infectious measles is, the common cold, cholera, Ebola, Zika, just take a couple of the, the newer ones, yellow fever. There's a range of how contagious these things are, how they're transmitted. If they're respiratory viruses, if there's a vector like mosquitoes uh, for yellow fever or malaria, um, you have to think how damaging and deadly the, it is. So what, when someone gets it, is it, is it like a common cold? Is it like the flu? Is it, um, like, uh, is it, uh, and so it, it's damage and death, not just how many deaths does it result in, but you can do real damage to people, including putting them in the hospital. Um, and you have to think what the after effects are. Does a person fully recover? Or is there some permanent damage or at least long lasting damage done? Um, you have to think about how much immunity exists in the general population. So how much can this spread? Uh, how many people are vulnerable to this? And that there, I mean, in this case, part of what is um, severe about it is that there's uh, thought to be very little immunity in the general population because it's a new, it's a novel virus. Uh, so the immunity has not developed. That has to be taken into account. And what kind of countermeasures people can take in regard to it? That uh, is there, are there antivirals? Are there vaccines that are available? Um, and if you, if you think about, let's take again the flu, it has a certain level of contagiousness we know how it's transmitted, that it's by respiratory means, and that's different than say, if it's sexually transmitted, you can take more countermeasures against um, a sexually transmitted infectious disease than you can when it's respiratory. 
and you it might not even come into contact with the person and you get it. Um, <clears throat> it's so it, you think about how it's transmitted. We think about how damaging it is, how deadly it is. There's immunity in the general population. Uh, it's part of the reason younger people are more susceptible to the flu than older is that you develop immunity over time because it's a viruses that are present um, in and spread in the human population for, I mean, obviously for hundreds of years. Um, and there's a vaccine available. Now it's not that effective, but it is a countermeasure that one can take. It does reduce uh, the likelihood and severity of getting the flu. And it's like, there's a ton of knowledge here. I'm certainly not an expert on this. I've read a little bit about this, but if you're thinking of what the government should be doing, it should be cataloging the range of infectious diseases that there are and thinking which ones fall below the threshold such that there's no legal interventions. It's, yeah, if you're living in a city, there's gonna be people who have the cold and have the flu and it's going to be spread uh, when we're talking seasonable flu, not a pandemic flu. Um, and that that's, that's part of life. It's part of your decisions of, of how much you're gonna go out to restaurants, if you're gonna live in a big uh, and, and densely populated city or if city living is not for you. So uh, thinking there's some kind of threshold for infectious diseases uh, and again, along these axes, that it falls below legal interventions. And there's ones that fall um, above the threshold, that go above the threshold, such that legal interventions are uh, legitimate. And it's again, I mean, a lot of, there's a lot known about the range of infectious diseases. So one way that you can think of it is, like imagine that malaria is a new disease or yellow fever is a new disease. Um, where what would is what is the proper legal response in regard to it and this helps you prepare when you do have a novel virus of thinking where does it fall within this range and therefore what are the appropriate legal countermeasures and then you have to think very carefully um, about the countermeasures um, it's so and it the countermeasures of what kind of coercive countermeasures are appropriate that, that can be legally imposed has to be related to the severity of the infectious disease you're dealing with, um, including its pandemic potential. So, um, but you can think of a whole range of things. There's, it, it can be that you're, if, if, if it's the, you have tested and you're detected as carrying this infectious disease that you're asked to just voluntarily stay at home. And, um, and it's not policed very much. That, like maybe if the police found you in a crowded stadium, and so they would say, look, you violated this and you're gonna be fine. But they're not actively monitoring it. You could imagine it's, it's you voluntarily stay at home, you self-isolate, but that it's more monitored. Um, there might be requirements for some, if it's respiratory and so on, if, um, if you need to go out, you have to wear a mask to go out. It could be that um, for, if it's, it's, it's severely contagious and it's, if there's, it's difficulty testing for, that they quarantine the whole households, household. So those that you come immediately and regularly in contact with are also quarantined. Um, and there's, there's there's a host of other things that you could, that I think are relevant. And when you read some of what the experts think about this and recommendations for what it means to be prepared, um, they've thought about this and many more things in regard to this. Um, so there's, and in order to execute this kind of function, that is to legally say, look, you're carrying an infectious disease, so you need to self-isolate, or you're gonna be quarantined at home, or your whole household is going to be quarantined at home. Um, the government has to have the ability and the legal system has to have the ability to test and then to isolate, which is why the, the issue of testing is so important that if, if this were codified in law, laws you have to be executed and you have to think of what are the means to execute them. And it wouldn't mean that government is in control of all testing, 
Uh, it has to develop and improve tests, but it has to buy tests um, and use tests so it could carry out this function. <clears throat> and you might think um, that this is a pipe dream, that you could have this kind of thing specified in law. But when, when you read some of what is out there, so one of the things that's interesting to read uh, from the CDC is uh, it, after the, this is a report that came out uh, after the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. It's called Community Mitigation Guidelines to Prevent Pandemic Influenza, uh, United States 2017. I think it came out in April 2017. And it's, it has both the thinking about, okay, viruses and infectious diseases. Um, now this is, it's particularly focused on influenza but it's the same kind of reasoning. They fall within a range of severity and they have thinking about like what the severity is and why. And then what are appropriate countermeasures, uh, including now the term everybody knows of social distancing and so on. Part of what's interesting in the CDC report is one, almost everything is regarded as voluntary. It's like the, this is in the self-interest of citizens to do if we're really faced with a pandemic uh, outbreak, uh, so a, a, a novel co coronavirus in this case that has reached pandemic levels. The ideas of social distancing, of washing your hands and so on, this would be that citizens would have the self-responsibility, the self-interest and the competence to do these kinds of things. Um, so it's when you read the, the, the CDC report, nothing like um, shutting down a city, let alone a state is contemplated that this would be an appropriate measure or even really that the government has this kind of power. Um, and this kind of thing and this kind of thinking and reasoning could be codified into law that it, it would be clear how the government, when it's faced with a new virus, how it's classifying it based on what kind of criteria, and it would be related to thinking about other infectious diseases, and what countermeasures are appropriate, particularly beyond the voluntary level, beyond recommending, look, we've got a new virus out there. Uh, there's evidence hand washing, um, destroys it, disinfecting surfaces in certain ways, destroys it and so on. You should really think about doing this as individuals, as businesses, as organizations. Um, the kind of most coercive measures, the CDC uh, recommendations consider are things like shutting down some schools in cities um, and prohibiting mass gatherings above a uh, certain size, but that's mass gatherings and schools so when no countermeasures are taken. So it's not, you're having a mass get gathering, say a, a football game on a Saturday, a Sunday, and you're testing people to see and sending them back like you're not, can't get admitted if you're carrying this infectious disease. So they're, con of, so even when they think of banning these coercively, it's if the individuals and the private actors and so have done nothing to counteract the threat, then it's a, the, the mass gathering and the spread of the disease, particularly if it's one's unable to test because tests haven't been developed or scientifically you haven't figured out how to test. Um, th that can't be done. Then it, it's these are focal points for the spread of the virus. And you can consider this as threatening behavior and it can be banned, but it goes nowhere to the level of uh, closing whole cities, let alone closing whole states. And there are places where these kinds of things have been enact en enacted into law, such that you're now, instead of saying, well, if we're faced with a pandemic, government has virtually unlimited power. It's thinking about the range of pandemics that could happen and thinking of what powers it should have given the, the range of possibility. And if you, if you um, uh, 
uh, I've been reading, and I'm sure a number of people in the audience have probably look, been looking at what is happening in Sweden. When you look at the Swedish laws, some of this has been codified into the law. And I think it's part of why uh, you're seeing the measures and uh, the lack of full lockdowns and shutting it down big geographical areas of the country. This has been codified into law. They have um, a range, now it's only, there's only three categories, which I think is too little, of where they classify a virus, that it's a, it's a contagious disease, that it's something like they put it as a threat to public health and a threat to society. Um, and they've put the novel coronavirus as in the, the worst, most severe category. That's how it's been classified. But they have also limits on the power of the government to quarantine places and to lock them down. And if you go to the, the Swedish public health, the public health agency, if you go to their website and they have a, um, it's in Swedish, but they have a, you can put it into English on the site, not a Google translate that might get a lot of things wrong. And they have questions like, can a whole town or city be placed in quarantine? I'm reading from the, the site. No, according to the Swedish Communicable Diseases Act, individuals can be put in quarantine, but not towns or cities. Um, it is possible, however, to impose a lockdown on a particular geographical area. And then the next question is, what is a lockdown? Under the Swedish Communica Communicable Diseases Act, an area corresponding to a few blocks may put in a, be put in a lockdown. And then it specifies reasons for that duration and so on. And this, I think of, of that this be codified into law and really be thought about and then codified into law. This, if we think of the American system as it's a rule of law and it's taking that the foundation of good government is to have proper laws, there would need to be, and it's possible to do this, real thinking about infectious disease and how to codify and limit, delimit the powers of government. And then you could, could plan for this. So it's it, part of the reason I'm bringing up the CDC's report is if it's not even entertained as a possibility that a whole state can be locked down, nobody will prepare for that. Nobody will think about it. Businesses won't think about like what happens if a whole state gets locked down and all our, our revenue goes from 100% to zero overnight and so on. Um, so the more it's specified into law, and I don't think this is a power that government should have or needs in this case, but the more it's specified into law, the more you have a rule of law and not of bureaucrats, particularly in this kind of situation, who uh, often will be panicked and then will respond from a position of panic, which I think is part, a significant part of what is going on now. Okay, let me say a little bit about this second question and we'll take some time for questions. <clears throat> so it, we need real thinking about what the government's role in infectious disease is. It has a role, but it, that role has to be co codified, delimited, um, because the whole form of US government is to delimit and specify explicitly the powers of the government. But in doing that, you have to think about what the government's role, that's uh, our goal, what its basic goal is in infectious disease. And I think particularly because what the pattern has been in the US, but as I said, I think elsewhere has been denial and evasion and then panic. There, it's understandable, though not good, I think, and not rational or even reasonable. But it's understandable that what it becomes is the goal is we've got to um, stop every death from this new coronavirus or whatever the, from the, the new virus. In this case, it's a coronavirus, but the same would be true if it was a flu pandemic. That the, and that can't be the goal. Um, it can't be that the goal now is and everything else is subordinate to we're gonna minimize the number of deaths from infectious disease. This is a new infectious disease. It wasn't contained at its source. 
And it's going to be something that we most likely will have to live with and have to adapt to. And it can't be that now, uh, because there's some new thing, that now the government has the power that our goal is to bring the number of deaths as close to zero as possible. And we have total control because that's the goal. And we need enormous amount of power, including shutting down whole states um, in order to realize this goal. And we don't think of this, if you take it outside the context of infectious disease, we don't think of it like this. So it's not, you wouldn't say it's the government's goal to reduce the number of deaths as close to zero as possible of poor diet um, and poor exercise habits. I mean, if government took control of these things, you could reduce the number of deaths that, I mean, there's particularly, it's thought that Americans have, um, relatively speaking, to say the Mediterranean countries, have relatively poor diet and exercise regimes. And if you gave control of this and said our goal is to reduce the number of these, this is government's function, so on, it could do things. It would need enormous coercive powers uh, and enormous control over people's lives and what you ate every day and so on. But you, if that was a goal, you could achieve it. And even in, in that, if you take it um, outside or back into the context of infectious disease. We don't think about the flu like this, that the government's goal is to reduce the damage and death, the number of hospitalization uh, cases, the number of deaths from flu as close to zero as possible. I mean, they could do various kinds of things. They could ban during flu seasons, large gatherings. You can have football games and baseball games and hockey games. So you can have concerts and so on. They could do a lot of things that would reduce the hospitalization rates um, and would re reduce the deaths from flu. But we don't think of that as the goal. And we don't write that. I mean, I think it's right to not think about that as the goal. Its goal, and this again, as the, thinking of it as the American form of government, is to execute the law. And it, that, it doesn't have its own goals, purposes, interests. The law is its motive power. We are here to execute the laws that are on the books. And it's precisely, I think, because we don't have laws on the books in regard to infectious disease. It's not nearly uh, codif codified, explicitly spelled out as it needs to be, that it's easy for this to become the goal of the government. That it, and Cuomo in, in New York State, it basically tells you, like, this is the goal. I'm, I'm trying to reduce deaths um, and number of cases as close to zero as possible. And I need to shut down the state in order to do that. If there were laws, it would be, no, what I have to do is execute the laws around infectious diseases, which delimit both when an infectious disease rises to the severity to be dealt with by the government and what its powers are in regard to dealing with it. And I don't think powers would be, we can shut down a whole state in regard to this. It's basically what execute the law would mean is the government's trying to remove the people who are contagious. And it, if it can test, isolate and track cases, that's what it should do. That's its basic power. Um, you can't have a fantasy about this. It's hard to do this and it's scientifically hard. And if you read about the 1918 flu pandemic, at that point in time, scientifically, they didn't even know that this, the flu and so this pandemic was a virus. So the idea that they're gonna have good and careful scientific tests for this, no, it's unlikely that they're gonna have it. They're gonna look more at a person's symptoms and so on. So this by itself, self, to test, isolate and track is an enormous task and it's difficult. And there's a lot of thinking that would have to go into this. But I think that's basically what um, the government's goal would be it's executing the law and the law would have things about its testing and isolating, like when it needs to do this, when an infectious disease rises to this level that it needs to start testing and isolating and how it would go about doing that. And then you can imagine as you get say in this, the CDC report that I was talking about, um, there can be rules for large gatherings for wearing face masks to go out, um, but it's, it's all should be in the context if when to say that its goal is to execute the law, the law exists to protect every individual. 
and to protect their rights, which means their freedom to act, their rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the freedom to act, to innovate. And in the face, I mean, if there's not the denial and invasion of, look, we've got a new virus that we have to learn how to deal with, you would see on the part of private actors, private companies, enormous action and innovation. Um, you would see, I mean, testing would be really important, particularly like if you think about large gatherings and if it, yeah, these can go ahead if you have testing in place. Um, how much money would pour in to testing from, I mean, just think of the sports leagues from the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, if it was, yeah, these can go ahead, but you have to have real testing regimes in place. So um, you would have enormous money and innovation going into these. And then um, sort of in the present circumstance, you would think the goal of the government is when it's getting in the way of this to decontrol. And if you've read anything about testing, there's been such an enormous amount of regulations uh, and pro prohibitions on private testing and university labs testing. So it's gotten better, I think, but it's still no, not anywhere close to good. Um, and let me make this the last point, which is <clears throat> the American system of government, part of what it means that everyone is equal, you're equal before the law, you're equal in your rights, is that it's not the government's function to engage in some kind of utilitarian or collectivist calculation, to, to think about whose life matters more than whom's or whose life matters more than someone else's livelihood. And so, yeah, to preserve these, um, to, to prevent these deaths, we're gonna cripple hundreds or thousands of people economically, they're gonna lose their jobs, they're gonna lose their businesses and so on, because these other people in their lives count more than this. This is not the function of the, of the US government and of a proper government. It's everybody's equal. Um, you have the equal rights. So it, to execute the law means you're upholding everybody's rights. And if you're really thinking about like, what you want in a pandemic, you want as much freedom of action on people's parts to to innovate and to figure out what is actually the best way to deal with these. And if you read, um, again, if you read say this, this CDC report, they're pretty open about how much is unknown, like how effective is social distancing? How effective is disinfecting surfaces and so on? And when there's that kind of unknown, you want people out there thinking about this, experimenting, innovating. And you can't get any of that if the response is, we're going to shut everybody down and we're going to shut the economy down. We're going to shut all action down with a goal that I think is not even a legitimate goal. <clears throat> so I think this crisis, and as I say, we'll talk more, I think, about this in the, in the second talk, but it warrants real rethinking about uh, what the American form of government is. And does this response look anything like what it should look like if we were trying to really apply, develop and apply American principles and ideals of proper government. Okay, let me stop there. Uh, and then we have a, a little bit of time for questions. Um, I had a little less time because Keith took a little bit of time at the outset. But, uh, and Keith, are you gonna rejoin in order to field some questions? Yeah, <clears throat> okay, so. As I mentioned before, we're, we're streaming on Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. And so we're taking questions on all those channels. Um, and we have a few questions in the Q&A session already. We have a kind of a general question, some general questions about quarantine. Um, uh, I'm just trying to find it here. So just a general question about quarantine. I mean, does the government of a free society have the power to lock people up in their houses? This is a question from Ken, who's suggesting that, you know, there's a separation of state and economics and, there's a, and, and does the government even have that power at all? So maybe you could talk a little bit about the power of quarantine as such. Um, so, so there's, at least in, in some of the CDC stuff, they seem to have two 
description. So isolation is when it's self-isolation. So it's when the person who's there's reason to think is contagious with an infection, I'm sorry, it has an infectious disease. Um, and there's re whether it's a test or whether it's symptoms, but there's some real reason. And again, the kind of level of evidence that's needed is what be specified in law. Um, so he's contagious. He has to isolate because now he's an active threat to other people. Um, and I think there's a legitimacy to that. But as I say, even that you have to think what forms of implementation are proper. And for, for ones that are not that severe, I can see it's basically on, um, it, it's, uh, on the honor system in effect. Like you've got a contagious disease, you've got to self-isolate for four days when you know, you're no longer infectious. Um, there's not an incredible amount of, of um, enforcement of it but if it was, if you're talking about something that is highly contagious and deadly, um, that you would have more enforcement of it. Uh, and I mean, you can even imagine like people on parole that it's you're wearing a, a anklet bracelet and they're keep monitoring that you actually stay at home um, and are not going out infecting. Uh, and part of the issue is you're un infecting unsuspecting people. This is part of the threat that like they don't know and they came into contact with you like something like measles it's when you read some of the medical literature it's someone could have been in, in an elevator half an hour before like you have no idea that even there someone was there and so on. you go in and you contract measles from them because it stays in the air that long um so it's warranted but it's it under highly specified situation i mean this is part of what it means to be codified into law and it's when a person's contagious, you're an active threat. Um, and a threat is something governments can deal with. They don't have to wait. Like if I go into the bank and say, look, I'm gonna shoot you unless you give the money, but I haven't shot anybody yet. That's a threat. But it's not like I, the government has to wait until I actually shoot the teller until it intervenes. And that same principle I think applies for infectious disease, though it's usually not intentionally you're trying to infect someone else. So, well, that was gonna be the next question. Professor D in the Zoom Q and A is asking about what about people who, who are, and are there laws and do, you know, who, who, who intentionally maliciously go and infect people. And it gives the example of someone who's, who's against a particular Senator and then they go up and sneeze on them knowing that they have COVID-19 or something like that. Yeah. I mean, presumably I that would be, well, you, yeah. Yeah, there should be laws against that, I think. And there are for some of these, and but again, to, to have a, a, a fully proper objective legal system, you would do it for these, many of these things. And when new ones emerge, they have to be codified into law. But something like HIV, it is a crime. And I think it should be a crime. If you don't disclose, you know you have HIV and you don't disclose to a sexual partner that you've got HIV. And so that is um, that should be a crime. In many places, it is a crime. And it makes sense because now it's you're deliberately, um, e either you're kind of recklessly endangering other people or deliberately trying to infect them. And both those fall into the category that law can and should address. Yeah. Now we, we, we've got a bunch of questions asking about, you know, you took a kind of step back and didn't talk specifically about what we should have done. Yaron uh, is going to be talking about some of that sort of thing. And he wanted to reserve the right to answer those questions. So if anybody is asking questions about what should we have done back in January, that sort of thing, that will come up later in your Q&A. Okay. Um, you talked about the kinds of laws that should be on the books and you gave examples of what exists in Sweden and that sort of thing. We had a question from Bob um, in the Zoom Q&A. Do you know what laws, you know, do you happen to know what laws already existed in the U.S. Um, about in relation to pet, how to handle infectious diseases? Um, so again, it's, it's another of many things here that I'm not an expert on. I've read a little bit on it. We had one, uh, if you go to ARI's YouTube channel, we had two lawyers, uh, one Larry Salzman, who's on our board of directors and one a former uh, uh, me a member of ARI staff, Steve Simpson, were talking about what legally, uh, I mean, currently under the U.S. legal system, what powers government has. And I've listened to a few. I listened to the uh, Jeremy, 
forget if it's Jeffrey or Jeremy Rosen at the Constitutional Center, and he had guests on this. And this is part of the both that think um, they both were in the vein that it's undefined. And right now it's sort of the default of the precedents, president, precedents, um, the legal precedents is there's enormous power in state governments to do this kind of thing. And that's just, it's, if you think of America as it's an experiment and it's the constitution was the start of the experiment, not, okay, we've got all the law we need and so on. That needs to be addressed in law. That, I mean, my, basically my second point is that you can't be this kind of unspecified, enormous, arbitrarily wielded power um, in the hands of government. This needs to be codified and delimited. So from what I, again, I'm not a legal expert, from, from what I've looked at, it's not well defined. Okay. All right, so we're, we were gonna leave 10 minute breaks between these sessions. We're gonna start at the top of the hour. So let's draw a line here. We're gonna take a break in just a minute. <clears throat> now we're gonna be continuing the broadcast during these breaks. So you don't need to log out and log back in. We'll just start back up at the top of the hour. Before we take a break, just a couple of little uh, announcements. Um, if we, we're holding a raffle for, we have 10 copies of this book, Ayn Rand Answers. So this is a collection of answers that Ayn Rand gave during question periods, and it covers a range of fascinating topics, you know, sex, drugs, and Ronald Reagan kind of thing. Um, so if you, disease. what's that? Even infectious disease. Even there's, I think, yeah, there's a couple questions in there. So, so um, I'm gonna be posting some, uh, posting a link and if you sign up for our email list, you can, I just posted that on the chat and uh, our, my colleague is gonna be posting it on YouTube and Facebook. If you go to einrand.org slash sign up, you can, you'll be entered into a raffle for one of 10 copies of Ayn Rand Answers. We'd also like to get your feedback uh, and find out a little more about you. So we have a survey and I'm gonna post this at each of the breaks. You only have to do it once, but uh, if you can take the time sometime during the day to tell us a little bit about yourself um, where you're coming from and your interest in Ayn Rand. Um, now, I, I also wanted to say, if you're, if you're getting value out of this event, please consider trading with us by donating to the Ayn Rand Institute. This event costs money to put on. You can help us offset this cost. You can become a member of the Ayn Rand Institute by choosing our monthly option for as little as $10 a month. You can support this kind of activity. And all you need to do is go to einrand.org slash donate. I'm gonna put that in the chat as well. And um, we, we appreciate that. And so now let's, let's take a break and we will resume at uh, the, the, that would be noon Pacific time. So we'll see you all in, in just a moment. Thanks, Keith.